the ocean was a really safe place for me, mm. even though it can be deathly and, um, and scary. But that's the place where I go to, I call it just washing off the day. Yeah, the ocean's that place for me to just, you just wholeheartedly concentrate on you. Yeah. Everything. There were times where it was real tough. Mum always said that we've got to have a, a house near the beach because if, we're, if the boys are in the ocean, they're out of trouble. Her just making those decisions changed our world. I met a gypsy. Today, before we get into this episode, I want to bring you a message from today's podcast sponsor, Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens is not only an all-in-one formula that helps me just cover all my nutritional bases, uh, it's also the first healthy habit that I have uh, that starts every single day. It sets the tone for a healthy day and just keeps my eyes laser focused on Glen Helen at the end of the year. Definitely notice improvements to my skin and massive improvements to my overall gut health. AG1 is packed with 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients of the highest quality that are able to offer gut health support, mood support, can affect your energy each day and contribute to overall healthier looking hair and skin. Go to athleticgreens.com slash gypsytales uh, if you want to get that free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs added to your first order. Thanks so much to the guys and girls at Athletic Greens. We're excited to have you on board. Sweet. Mick Eugene Fanning, welcome to Gypsy Tales, mate. Cheers, man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It's uh, we've got to give Dr. a bit of a shout out for uh, for getting this one dialed in. So, when was the when was the first time you met Danny Rick? Uh, when was it? I think it was two thousand nine or ten. Yeah, yeah. I think that's um, early days. Yeah, yeah. So he was the backup driver for Red Bull back then. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, that was when uh, Mark Webber was still on Red Bull yeah, F1. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, he just came, he was around the Melbourne, uh, F1 and we had a, a athlete summit down there and he came and hung out and, uh, yeah. So that was sort of the first time and sort of just kept in contact over all those years. Yeah. Yeah. He's one of the good dudes really, isn't he? He is. He's funny. It's, it's funny. You walk around, um, F1 too. And, um, you know, you sort of just you talk to anyone doesn't matter who and they hear your Australian voice and they're like oh do you know Dan and they're like yeah, yeah Dan's the best so it's, yeah yeah nah so shout out to to Danny for for helping make make this one happen so mate just life in general how's life you mentioned before got a three-year-old that is uh, that is teaching you some things so uh yeah i yeah. guess uh, how, how's uh life in general life's good life's good um you know i guess sort of different to when I was on tour and stuff like that. Um, you know, it, it's sort of you never, like I, I never had a schedule on tour. Yeah. Um, the only schedule I have now is, um, you know, making sure that I am there for, for my son yeah. um, when he needs me. And um, yeah. And then I try and get all work and everything done in between when he's at, daycare and stuff yeah uh, other than that i'm trying to be home as much as possible and but yeah it's fun I, I enjoy it um and yeah it's good to just be with the family like i did a a trip recently and um yeah or well, i miss them like hell so yeah. uh, it's good to be home did you were you like ready for kids do you know how people say like you're never ready yeah kids? like were you were you ready for it or did you have any idea of what it was going to be like going into it well i'm from a big family so i'm the youngest of five yeah and then um i have six nieces and nephews um yeah probably about six or seven god kids so yeah, I, right. I was ready i was ready um so yeah but it's so different when you're when you're there like 24 7 yeah um especially those early days like the first 10 days of having a kid you don't know what's going on you're yeah. just in this world of just like it's euphoric uh it's like like people say it's the best the best experience you'll ever have 
but that's where they leave it. Like, that's what guys yeah, say. And yeah. I'm like, well, you got to explain it more because, you know, I do the best shit every day. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's sort of like, for me, it was like getting all that barrel stoke of, you know, having yeah. the best surfs of my life all piled into one. Yeah. And um, so that's what child, child, having a child is like for me. And then you're just learning. Yeah. Oh, every single day you, you're on you're learning and um, yeah I, at the moment I'm learning a lot of patience because um, <laughs> he's three right he's yeah he'll be three in August so yeah. um, so the terrible twos is like a real thing yeah yeah we didn't think so for a while yeah um, and he was like like he's so mellow like I think he gets that from his mum but he's so mellow and then just every now and then he'll just have a meltdown and you can't reason with him you (laughs) cannot reason with him it's wild but it's you know it's cool you sort of you know it teaches you that all right you sort of relearn oh shit that's how I was yeah you know like I remember my brother's giving me shit as a kid and just saying you're having a wobbly (laughs) yeah I was uncontrollable yeah. like punching people and all that kind of stuff and so yeah i guess i'm just getting my own right now i can imagine too that so like you're a dude that's dealt with like fear and anxiety around performance and pressure and like high pressure situations and that was kind of like business as usual but then i can imagine having a kid like that would be in my mind that would be like the first real fear you would experience in your life in a sense because it's like there someone said i can't remember who it was but it was like that's the first time you're like faced with your own mortality like i need this thing can't die like this is fully like that's such a heavy deal to go through. and it's so real um i remember when we when we found out that brie was pregnant i didn't speak for the whole day the only word i could say was shit (laughs) i'm like oh my god i'm gonna have to provide and and look after this child and there's no there's no question about it i have to be there yeah and then as i was saying that that first 10 days you don't know if you're awake or asleep um and yeah you're just trying to figure out how to keep this baby alive and it's just a it's teamwork between you and your partner and it's um yeah like you you're meant to be awake with them, and then you fall asleep, and you wake up freaking out. And, and but they're so resilient. Yeah, your babies are so resilient, and kids are so resilient. Um, but yeah, I always feel like I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one thing. Like, did you ever have the uh, the I guess like the the epiphany moment where you were like, you get to be like 30, 35. And that's probably when you could remember like how old your mum was or your dad was when you kind of first, you remember like, oh, they're actually just, I'm their age now. And they were as just as confused as I was. But when you're a kid, you look at your parents and you think they've just fully got it dialed. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I'd probably be around similar ages to what my parents are yeah, yeah. Um, when they had me. So, um, but you know, I was the fifth, so <laughs> I was just, I was just rolling around with brothers and, and sister and just, um, yeah, I was the least of their worries. I think, um, <laughs> I think the first couple were the ones that sort of kept them up at night. What's the, what would you say is different to, well, not that you have any comparison, but to come from a big family, like what's the, I guess what's the advantages and disadvantages of coming from such a big, big family? Um, you can deal with mayhem. Yeah. Like when when shit hits the fan, or you know, it's time things change. Um, when you don't have your schedule right, or you know, all of a sudden you're trying to get the little one into the car, and something else happens. Like that's what I feel like I can deal with. Yeah. And where my partner Bree, she's she's the single she's a single child. Oh, so, that'd be so different. Yeah, so she's sort of so different. And you know, if we start looking at more kids, it's like she's like, oh, how am I going to control everything? I was, I was like, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> you just fly with it. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. like let it do its thing. Yeah. Did you have any? How long have you been retired for now? Uh, I retired in 2018, so yeah. five years now. Did you? have any like plan for that 
that time because you're one of those guys from when you were on tour, it was all on tour. Like, I don't really ever think there were many years that you didn't look at as like a 110%. Like, do you know when you're kind of getting up to retiring that it's like you're going to go from being Mick Fanning, three times world champion, just the fucking man, everyone like wants the piece of your photos, videos, trips, sponsors, all that sort of stuff. So then it's like, at some point, you're just going to be like Xander's dad kind of vibe, you know? <laughs> I'm trying to be Xander's dad. <laughs> um, yeah, look, it, it for me, it was, it was different. It was, um, you know, I sort of, I started thinking about like the next phase of life around 2013. Yeah, really? Um, you know, I spoke to my coach and um, spoke to uh, my, my sports site guy at the time um and i was like look i don't know how much longer i'm going to be on tour for like i started feeling like things um winning a heat or you know winning an event it was fun don't get me wrong but it didn't carry as much meaning yeah um yeah. and then after 2015 where i just had that that hell year um, I remember walking off the beach, even when I lost the world title, I just walked off and I, I didn't care. I never, never looked back. Um, I watched Adriano raise his arms up for winning the world title and I, I just walked off. I've never watched the heat again. Um, and in 2016, I sort of had half a year off and I just wanted to do just different stuff i wanted to go yeah. and just fill the fun tank in in my own words um and i was like do i come back do i not is that how i want to leave it and um i was having a couple of beers with parker and he's like come back just one more year one more year yeah. and i'm like okay okay and within the first two events i knew i didn't i knew yeah. i didn't care anymore yeah, yeah. um so it just it for me it just switched off. Yeah. Um, but caring about the anxiety and the and the result just just disappeared. Yeah. And I started to see it all slip. Um, you know, I uh, training started getting subpar. Perform uh, preparation was subpar. And then I think Results my performance was, was subpar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was, it was just one of those things where I was just like, I'm done. I'm out. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but in saying that I wanted to go and, and do trips. I wanted to go and experience things that I'd never experienced before. Yeah. Um, because as amazing the tour is, you keep going the same spots year in, year out. And yeah. I just need to change. And that was my focus leading out of that. Um, but yeah, I, I'm happy to disappear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did come back to the, the start of the question. Um, yeah, I'm happy to disappear and just be Xander's dad. That's such a good place to be though, because it can be such a challenge for people that have, you, you just live in such a weird world for so long. Like it's just not, very normal but it becomes super normal to the athlete and then you just have like this hard break and then you go to a normal life like obviously there's still like a bit of a hangover there you know like mm. especially when you've got the achievements that that you've got like you'll always be that guy but just in I guess like you said with a kid like there's 24 hours in a day and it's like you might have gone from being that guy 24 hours a day to that guy like three hours a week yeah yeah fully um yeah i think i think the hardest thing for athletes when they do retire is some of them um that's their identity yeah yeah and, you know that's where all right i'm a pro surfer pro footy player um and they they just don't have anything else after that yeah and um, you do find it hard in, you know, when you're staying home a lot or, yeah. you know, you're not getting on a plane every other day or, you know, for footy players, not going into the sheds and yeah. hanging out with Being around mates. the boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is a, um, there is a bit of a shift and it takes, um, it, it takes a bit of work to, you know, looking in the mirror and say, are you okay with this and that sort of thing. Um, but I learned that in 2016 where i had the the half a year off yeah 
I was okay with sitting on the couch all day. Yeah. <laughs> Turning into a fat mess. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, it was, yeah, it was, I sort of did a bit of a different transition to what, yeah. um, to what most people do because I did get to go back and experience it and then had that decision of like, do I want to stay here or do I not? Yeah. And even since then, like going and doing wild cards and stuff like that. It's a completely out. different vibe. Yeah, I, I paddle out and I'm like, what am I doing here? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm good. I'm good not to be that person. Yeah. It's funny. You said before that the anxiety you'd feel around the heat. I, I don't know why I've been thinking about it, but even so like this podcast, for example, it's like, all right, I come into work and, and there's a level of anxiety that you've got around just making sure, all right, is everything sweet? Is that, and I would imagine that that's the same or like there's a required level of anxiety that you need to feel to perform in anything. And if you don't have that anxiety around performing, then like you're probably not going to prepare. You're probably not going to, it's, it's funny that the, probably the greater the anxiety you feel about something, the more performance that you could actually extract out of yourself because it's like that anxiety is what's driving you to do well, if that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. I think um, what it is is if you don't have that, if you don't have that anxiety or you don't have those nerves, do you really care? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so like I always... Um, I always pr- I like pride myself on being prepared, being ready yeah. for yeah. any situation. Even if I wasn't the favorite or anything, I was like, I'm going to give it my all. Um, and and I sort of I needed that. Yeah, I, that kept me like. There were some times I was like, please just let me sleep for a bit. But <laughs> yeah. um, but I needed that because I didn't want to have that um that what if moment yeah. oh, I should have done that better I should have um you know approached it a bit different and stuff like that and and they're the ones I think those what ifs or should have could have water moments they're the ones that keep you up at night so that anxiety kept me sharp um and kept me uh yeah on point to keep moving forward um you know it, and it's weird like even just going back and doing a wild card and and having the anxiety for the call if yeah. I'll surfing or not that yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. Like, Do I even like this? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but that's all I knew at the time. So it was um, it was it was real. But as a, as you say, it um, just kept me on point. Yeah. And and if that goes away, that feeling like it's very very hard. Or I wonder if there are people out there that can perform at a hundred percent just because they want to perform at a hundred percent. Like they're not feeling any of the, whether they, you know, frame it as anxiety or frame it as excitement or no, or however the, the framing is. It's like, I wonder if there's even anyone out there that can perform at a hundred percent that doesn't get that. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Like I look at, you know, my peers, like I look at Parker and he is he's a jedi man he he's just nothing seems to worry that guy yeah right you know never had to sit down and and talk him through bad situations or whatever he always seems like he's just cruising through life and even when we're competing he he would like he would have so much fun and then he would just like switch on and I'm like, how do you do that? I can't do that. Yeah. Um, and we're just so opposite. Like even like 20 minutes before he paddles out, he's talking to everyone, he's playing games and just, yeah, going fishing and shit. <laughs> and I'm so like, maybe like, some dudes can just, yeah. just turn it on like that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. He's just so relaxed. But, you know, he was an early, he was a young dad too. So maybe maybe that switched it off. He's like, I don't need to prepare. <laughs> I've got kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you mentioned before it was a sports psych. Did So how, how early did you start working with a sports psych and then how important was that to go through your career and like yeah did you frame it as anxiety or did you call it another word for that feeling that you had or um yeah so i sort of dealt with different sports psychs and that um throughout my years uh and then it wasn't until 2009 um 
I met uh, Dr. Michael Gervais. Okay. Um, and yeah, we like from the first moment I met him, I was like, this this guy's the man. Like really? within half an hour, I'm in his office just pulling my eyes out, just letting it all go. And um, and from that situation, like he just gave me a couple of tools, and I went from. I was sort of having, I felt like I was performing really well, but I was making really bad decisions, uh. um, like in heats and stuff. And he gave me a couple of tools. And for the back half of the year, I ended up winning three out of the last five events. And so I was like, oh, it works. <laughs> and um, we became good friends since then. But, um, but yeah, we never really talked about um, like, anxiety or stuff like yeah. that it was just for us it was more preparation yeah um but also to i guess or maybe there was parts of it that he could see because he would always he would always give me tools to to go okay well if you're feeling like you need to do more work maybe you just need to just do specific work for like half an hour a day even yeah. if you can't surf or even if you can't get in the water or you're flying or something. And that's where um, meditation and visualization came in for me. Yeah. And that really took a lot of the anxiety out of like, huh. like my mates now laugh at me because I play golf now. Yeah. Where I couldn't play golf when I was on tour. Really? Like, yeah. I was like, if I was on the course for five hours, so you just chalked that up to lost time that someone else was doing more than you? No, it was more just I was always wondering what the waves were doing. Uh, or I was wondering what, um, you know, I could be doing something yeah. to better myself or yeah. or whatever. And most of the time I was just sitting on my ass at home. But, um, but yeah, and so he sort of doing the visualization and the um, meditation. I'd do it every night before I went to bed. And I knew at the end of every single day, I'd do my work. Yeah. So I could go and enjoy the day and do those things. Still didn't play golf, but um, yeah, I could just go and enjoy it and just know that in the back of my mind, I'm going to go do the work. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was a really good tool for me. And that really helped me um, keep that anxiety pretty low. Yeah. It was still there, but... Um, just kept it pretty low. What did meditation look like for you? Um, meditation was, I'd start off just by stretching and breathing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, people think if you're going to meditate, you just have to be, mm. you know, cross-legged. Yeah. yeah you yeah. know, fingers up um, and singing on. But for me, it was more breathing and and just feeling the body in movement um, and and stretching and then and then I would go through the body from you know from the brain like or a body scan yeah, yeah full yeah, body yeah, scan yeah, yeah. Um, some days I would just sit there and just watch my thoughts mm. um, and just be like what's going on see we we used to call them trains yeah and you know you just watch where the train went to and huh. if it stopped at a station and you didn't want to go any further, you just get off. Yeah. Um, and so that was, that was cool. Just watching thoughts and just, you know, like a weird old brain, I'll tell you. Um, and then finally I would just visualize whatever event was coming up next or what event I was in and just visualize, um, just going and surfing a heat. Yeah. And, you know, that could take, could take half an hour, could take an hour, could take five minutes. Yeah. It all just depend on what I was feeling on the day. I never put pressure on um, a time limit. That yeah. was a big thing for me. Like I didn't set an alarm. You got to meditate for this long or that. It yeah. was just whatever I felt like in the t in the time, which was nice. Dude, that's so cool. I uh, yeah, I'm a big meditation proponent. Like yeah. a, that's sort of heretic for it probably at this point, but I really don't think people put enough like maybe even any time into like literally what you said like watching your thoughts yeah like just sitting there pr as like the pre-thought or like the space where thoughts actually percolate and arise and then disappear and it's like and if you can see that enough times then you can sort of start to see like you're not 
you don't think your thoughts before you think them. Like they just appear they just, yeah. and then they go away. Exactly. And, it, and that's actually like not many people ever really sit with that long enough to actually, first of all, like have that experience. And then secondly, like think about the implications that act, that that actually has on your life and Mm. it's like it's quite a a profound thing that most people will just never put the effort or see the importance of actually doing no it's yeah it there's so much power in that um and as you said like sometimes you you don't have the courage to sit and look at your thoughts too Mm. um and sometimes it's scary um and that's where i you know, talking about the trains or whatever. Yeah, I've never heard that at all. Yeah, and so you sort of sometimes you get on a on a train and you know where the track's going. Yeah, and you're like, you know what? I, just I don't, don't want to go there. This, I don't yeah. want to go there today. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just going to get off here. Yeah, and yeah. then you know you can start again or you just stop. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would always to to help with that too. I would always um, I was big in compartmentalizing. Yeah. So I'd always have um. It's like a, a chest in the in the corner of the room, like yeah. just psychologically. And I even if it was like, say, I've got to go and get groceries. All right, I can't do that right now, so I'm going to put that in the chest. Yeah, and yeah. I'll deal with that when I have time. Or um, yeah. but then also, if I had bad thoughts or whatever, I'd put them in the chest, lock them up, and deal with them when I had the courage to go and yeah. um, look at them and. And for me, um, it was something that yeah helped me be more focused, yeah. um, or be more present, more mm. like it actually. So like if I'm in a room and talking to someone, I wasn't thinking about what's going on down the road or or something like that. And um, that was a that was a, something I had to learn as well because you know some years on tour I was not in the room. I was. Yeah, thinking, I was thinking ten steps ahead of everyone. So yeah, and did you have the experience of like so you you're meditating and then you kind of start to have the or start to really see the experience of like okay, there's like a there's a me before the thoughts come, so like I'm not my thoughts, and then when you just go into everyday life i think it's cool what you said like meditation isn't just like sitting on a cushion doing that like essentially your whole life is a meditation like you can like for me first thing in the morning when i'm making a coffee that's like a meditation in a sense and i'm i'm making the coffee i'm on i'm on autopilot and then i'm just like waiting to see when like a, you know the train of thought starts coming and it's like you're not present when you're thinking without knowing that you're thinking. Yeah. You know, so it's like once you, if you practice it enough, whether, you know, formally meditating, those trains are coming all day, every day <laughs> when you're driving, when you're sitting, when you're talking to someone, when you're walking, like that, that those trains always are rolling through, you know? Yeah. And so did you, were you able to sort of like start to just apply that everywhere in your life? Like you notice like, okay, there's some, there's some trains rolling and, and then it does like center you and bring you into more of the moment. Yeah, put some trains on strike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're done for the yeah. day. Um, yeah, look, you, you, your brain just like Grand Central Station. It's just yeah. all day, every yeah. day. Um, but yeah, I think I think I think you you start to learn like some thoughts are really scary to get into, and you're like, shit, how do I how do I deal with this? And sometimes, like as I said, when you have the courage and you just keep going and see where they go. You almost dissolve yeah. the fear of it all. Yeah. Um, but and then going back to like all day meditations and stuff, like I would just if I had nothing to do and I was just walking down the street or something, I'd just start breathing with my steps. Yeah. Um, no one knows what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, no one sees that I'm being a weirdo. Um, but I'm yeah, I'm just counting my steps and that's that's my way of just switching off the brain for five minutes and, yeah. and being able to deal with whatever comes next. So, yeah, there's there's a whole different way. Um, I, I like the active meditation yep. type of things yep. um, just because, um, yeah, I feel like you concentrate better 
on doing stuff. Yeah. You're more in the zone. Yeah. And I think that helps you when, especially in a sport like surfing, yeah. where you've got to be centered yeah. to see waves or, or do the moves and stuff like that. So, yeah, I like the active meditation and then also, if you get like a red ball thrown at you, a blue ball, or the, all these things start coming in, you can slowly slow them down as well. So yeah, um, yeah, that's that's the way I sort of look at it all. Did you ever have like a a link between? Because I think that for me, so like growing up, it was motocross, like that was my thing that I was into, or, or like bikes in general, right? And I just remember being a kid and having that realization, like I'm not thinking when I'm on my bike. Or I, I, before that, I probably had more so a thought of like, why am I obsessed with riding? Like, mm. why does every waking moment, all I want to do is ride? And then I sort of slowly started making the connection of like, because I'm not thinking when I'm on my bike. And it's almost like, I would say like, that's where I'm the most me. It's because there's no like me plus like thoughts. It was yeah. just me being there doing that thing. Did you ever like have that link and think maybe that's why you liked surfing so much or was it, or did you ever make those connections as a, like a younger dude? Yeah, it sort of happened um, more so when I, when I lost my first brother, like mm. um, it was a place where I could go concentrate on me uh, and, and think about my thoughts with nothing else going on. You're not distracted by TV or anything like that. You're, yeah. you're thinking about what wave's coming or you're thinking about how you're going to do the next turn. But while you're sitting there, you can sort of dissolve the thoughts in your brain or go through them. And, and because you're in, you know, the ocean was a really safe place for me, mm. even though it can be deathly and, um, and scary. But that's the place where I go to... I, I call it just washing off the day mm. or, you know, starting the day right. And um, and so, yeah, the ocean's that place for me to just, you just wholeheartedly concentrate on you. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. And that's probably the same way you get in the bike where you it doesn't matter how you feel before you get on the bike or get in the ocean, you always feel better yeah. afterwards because you've concentrated on you for a moment. Yeah. And, and I think that's what some people really miss is that you know we're always or people are always trying to help someone else or thinking about someone else's thoughts or this and that but if you can't concentrate on yourself for a bit then how are you going to better yourself to actually help these people the way that they yeah. need to be helped so yeah. yeah giving yourself that time to heal and and um and center yourself makes you a better person for everything else you got to do in life yeah and it's uh, it sounds fairly cliche you know when you hear like that you've got to fill up your cup to pour to someone else like yeah. <laughs> but it's actually it's pretty true you know like and i think you know you probably relate with like your mom or your dad or like other people around you where it's like they're giving so much to you and it's like you could probably see them like wearing themselves out uh, themselves out to a point you know so it's like i think you are right and it, even though it is cliche it's such an important thing but most people maybe they don't feel like they've got the freedom to even do it or maybe they uh, or maybe people are kind of scared that like you said what comes up when they do just go and deal with their own shit yeah yeah oh it's it's funny like i guess another way of analogy is like you have a kid and you know you want to be with that kid 24/7 but when you drop them off at daycare and you've got time for yourself, it's like, oh, okay, I can go and recharge these batteries. So yeah. when when you go and pick your kid up at 3 p.m., you've got you're 100% energy. back, yeah, you're there, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, that's sort of, um, it's another way of looking at it, but you've got to be, you've got to give yourself fuel to yeah. to keep on going. Otherwise, you're just going to fall in the heap and you'll be shit house for yourself and everyone else around you. So you've got to give yourself time. Yeah. So you mentioned your brother before. That's obviously like one of the more traumatic things a person can go through. And I think I, I, read, I read your book a couple of years ago, actually. And one of Didn't the- Didn't put big, you to sleep. <laughs> no, nah, I actually, dude, I actually read it. I'll send you a picture after the podcast. I read it in a hammock at the tip of Australia. Wow. And I just, over two days, I pretty much just smashed the whole thing. Shit. Uh, so I was like- straight chilling when i when i read it but um you read your book and it's obviously everyone's got their shit but it's like it was a pretty traumatic life you know like you kind of 
you were close to the beach and then Penrith and then, you know, like dealing with your parents splitting up and then moving up to the Gold Coast and then you lose your brother. Like, so it's a pretty chaotic life. And then you go on tour and then that's its own version of chaos and crazy injuries and like all the ups and downs. Like, is it weird to be you now living in relative not chaos because you're essentially like chaos <laughs> but it would be like by choice nowadays yeah. you know what i mean like to go through that much chaos and like traumatic shit to be at a place now where you kind of like choose your own chaos in a sense or am i reading it wrong um no like i feel like chaos is that's where you can't control things yeah um and you know, life goes up and down. You you're gonna you're gonna hit speed bumps. You're gonna hit real deep valleys, dark valleys. But I think, you know, out of all the things that have happened to me over the years, like sure, there's been some you know really messed up things. Um, but I feel like I'm cruising on top of the mountain most of the time. Yeah. Um, even through all that. Even through all that, like yeah, it's like. <laughs> Like I'll sit there and think about my brothers and and that and it's dark. It's a really dark place, yeah. but I'm, you know, it's not every second of every day that I think about it. Yeah. It's it's I I prepare myself to go and think about it, and then sometimes it'll just sucker punch me in the face, and I'll just start crying while I'm driving or, or on a yeah, plane yeah. or something like that. But but um, yeah, a lot of my time growing up and all these different things they're almost like grounding situations um it's like all right you've been up here for so long you've got to come back down a little bit to sort of recognize and and um also i guess reassess where you are in life yeah um you know i don't i don't wish anyone to go through shit that i've been through but for me it was like okay this is this is the bottom of the barrel. This is the absolute worst. Life's only going to get better from here, and that's how yeah. I look at it. So, like, even looking at it, if it, like, sure, there were times where it was chaos, yeah. But most of the time, I'm I'm building up to the top of the mountain, and you know, for me, that I'm calm with that. Yeah. Um, but you just yeah, you just go through shit times in life, and if you didn't then you don't appreciate the yeah, good times. Yeah, 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 yeah. You need like that that polarity. Otherwise, yeah. you kind of don't recognize when things are good anyway. Yeah. Like you, you, like I see people that, and it's a totally different thing, but like you see people that, you know, they've got everything they need in life, but they're still not happy. Yeah. But then you see a, a kid in Africa kicking an empty water bottle down the street yeah as a soccer ball having the best time of their life and it's like well why do we need all this other shit you know and so um that's how i look at it i'm like you you don't want those things to happen but sometimes it's it's um yeah having that grounding you need that to see where you want to be yeah where do you reckon that mentality kind of came from like was that do you think that it was something innate that when those things happened that that was like your first response or is that something that like you really had to learn over time or people had to like kind of really give you that information um i don't know i really don't know um you know growing up we weren't the richest family um you know we go from paycheck to paycheck and um but we had so much fun yeah you know yeah you know, would we would have kids at our house, and they would all come there, and would make it as fun as possible. And none of us had money, yeah, but would make it fun. And we sort of realised that you don't need money to have fun, or you, you know, you don't need all these possessions to have fun. It's like relationships, or just going surfing, or just having, um, you know, experiences. That's what makes life fun. Yeah, um, yeah. And when when shit hits the fan, it's those people, your family and your friends that come around and help support you through those hard times that, um, yeah, they're the, that's, that's, I, maybe you just learn it through them, yeah. you know, and you, you support each other through those times, you know, if mates having a hard time or family members having a hard time. It's like, all right, we're here. 
let's get through it together. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know where you learn. I think you just sort of pick it up as you go. Yeah. Cause it, it can just go either way. Right. Like it, it's such a, I guess in, in those like really like gnarly times, it, man, it can, like you can have that outlook or just as easily. And people would understand like, Oh yeah, he's going like this, this, and this has happened to him. Like, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And also too, I, I probably wasn't, wasn't sheltered from it all. Yeah. You know, whatever was happening in the household or with my brothers or, or whatever, I wasn't sheltered. I saw it all. Yeah. And, you know, I had to make conscious decisions of, all right, I'm not doing that. or I'm not going to go down that path. And because I, I can see where that path leading, mm. leading and I, I don't want to do that. I want to go down this path and hopefully create something that I, and proud of um you know i don't want to waste anything so um yeah i guess just seeing those experiences too is probably something and um that's something that will i keep looking at yeah like i'm not gonna judge people for going down that route but yeah yeah i don't like that route so i'm gonna go another one so um yeah it's I don't know, I'm probably speaking in like no, crazy no, 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 terms. no. So you, before you're talking about like happiness, there's actually something I was talking to my partner about the other day. Like she, she just said off, off the cuff, like, oh, you know, like, are you happy? And I'm like, I actually don't even know if happiness is like a thing by itself that you have. Like I think, and maybe some people look at happiness as like a, oh, that's this thing that, that you have. It's its own entity. It's like, for me, happiness comes through like, fulfillment at work and relationship it's like more there's like these verticals and if you're like crushing it at these specific things like the sum of those parts equals happiness Mm -hmm. as opposed to like it being one specific thing like do you think about that at all or how that kind of relates yeah um brie and i ask each other all the time are you happy and my answer to her like even in when like there's a million things going on in the world or whatever but if I come back to my core and I see her and I see my my son and and all of a sudden just thinking about them I just have a calmness and Mm. and that's my happy yeah you know going for a surf and coming in calm that's my happy yeah um you know there's always going to be shit flying around but as long as you come back to your core and um, and just sit and you're okay to sit with yourself, yeah, I think that's happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's probably a good way to look at it. So has surfing changed for you now that you've retired? Like obviously there's a couple of wild cards here and there, but like does surfing mean something different when you're Mick Fanning going for, you know, your second world title at like the peak of fame and then – the Mick Fanning that could go to Kira this afternoon or Snapper this afternoon? Like, is surfing different? Yes and no. There's there's always been two two different sides of surfing. There's been the lifestyle side of it, yeah, where I go with my mates or I go with my family um, and it's all about fun. And then there's the work side of it. And the work side is training to be better, training to win events, training to be able to perform um and now like going through those times where we talked about like going for world titles and stuff like that i was probably 95 percent in the work phase of surfing yeah where i'm probably 95 percent in the lifestyle (laughs) side of surfing yeah um like it's very rare i go and and surf and and feel like i have to work yeah which is nice um so yeah it's it's Similar, just different, just different equations on the lifestyle versus the um, work side. Like, I haven't surfed in a week or so, and but I'm happy just to go down the beach with my family and just swim or yeah, or, yeah, or, yeah. you know, ride a couple of whitewashers or something or or push them out. Um, it just it just changes. Do you like? Do you still learn about surfing even now? as like the, you know, the last time that you surf, do you still feel like you're out there kind of like learning or you can just completely let go and just like, cause that, I guess that's probably 
would be the most in the moment. Maybe not. Like, I guess you'd be pretty locked in at, like, pipe or something like that. But I'm guessing just go out now, like, be a very free feeling surfing. It's it's a lot free, yeah. Um, but there are times, like, as as I'm getting older, your body changes. Like, your body yeah, changes yeah. every day, yeah. week, whatever. Um, and as you get older, the turns that I could do when I was younger, I'm learning that, I'm not doing those as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I've got to figure out ways to make my body adapt and um, do the things that feel good to me. Yeah. And so that's, I'm still learning. Um, I'm probably not learning new moves. I'm just learning how to fake them a little better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But it's, um, yeah, you're still, you're still working um, in that situation. Um, but yeah, and, you know, I, I probably... I, I ride a lot different boards yeah, than when yeah. I, you know, when I was on tour, I used to be just all about performance. Yeah. It used to be performance boards where now it's, I'm riding twin Nick fanning, and, soft tops. Yeah, all kinds of shit. Yeah. Um, and I ride those and I'm learning on those, you know, can it do this? Can it do that? And, and that's exciting too. So yeah, you're always learning, but yeah, it's more leisure than work. Yeah. Did you ever feel, uh, were you one of the guys that, at a point like you, you, everyone knows a professional athlete that they liked winning, but they didn't like surfing or, you know, like there's guys like Ricky Carmichael is like the greatest motocross rider of all time. And you talk to him and he's like, I hated racing. I loved winning. Like, yeah. Were you ever that guy or is, or was it always like fun to do the work in a sense? Um, look, it, it was fun to do the work for sure. Yeah. Um, and, but there were moments in my career where I was just like, this isn't fun. Yeah. This is like, I'm not, not enjoying this. But was that to do with the surfing or like more the everything around it? I think it had to do with, with everything like surfing as well. Um, and so, you know, in my early years, it was all about, I would base myself on a result. Mm. And then, and then I started like, well, you know, some results wouldn't happen, but you know, I was still getting good results and, but I still wasn't happy. Yeah. Um, and so I had to change, change where the goalposts sat of like, all right, what's going to make you, what's going to fulfill your happiness? Is yeah. it winning a contest or is it going to be the process of it all or like executing yeah, yeah yeah and so i sat down with myself for a long time and and i was like you know what i enjoy doing this part of it this part of it this part of it and if i can enjoy that part the results don't really matter yeah um and they'll probably come they come if anyway you get those few things right yeah so i just i just i just looked at like my goals and everything were or it just started shifting and it was all process based. Yeah. Yeah. Like making sure I was ready, making sure that I had, um, you know, even if I was in a heat, I wouldn't care if I win a lot, won or lost. But if I set myself a, a points goal to get that, and if I won or lost, didn't matter. But as long as I hit my goal, I was happy. Yeah. So, so it was like game within a game. Kind yeah. Of. Yeah. And, um, yeah, because you, you, you lose a lot more than you win. Mm. So you got to figure out ways to win. Have your wins goals. Even, yeah. even while you're yeah. losing. Yeah, even just walking to the beach. God, I look good look walking down the beach. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I could say the same. <laughs> so you've always been like a massive, like, sport guy in general, right? So, like, surfing, rugby league, you retire from surfing, you're like fully involved in like the NRL with the, you know, the panthers and then all the afl stuff like what is it about sport for you that just like like you're a lifer with sport yeah oh, mate I, I think it's just there's so many things to love about sport mm. and you know it's like as we we're talking earlier about just being 100 percent you in those situations um and then for me i really like to look at um the psychology of sport and i yeah. like to look at um, I guess processes again. Um, you know, I guess one of my favorite athletes, 
um, when I was on tour was Roger Federer. Mm. Like, how could he keep his cool for five hours? You know, you have a look over all the years that he went. He never re- he may have smashed a racket once or twice. Yeah, he was pretty pretty level. Nothing. Yeah, he had nothing, and I was and I always loved that. Like, but then he would just break down at the end of it and ball his eyes out. Or, yeah, you know? yeah, and, yeah. And I think that was. I just love the way that that process was. Um, and you know, there's there's different athletes now that I love watching. Like Nathan Cleary for me is. I just love watching him play because he he's such a student, not only of the game but like of of sport and all that kind of stuff. And you can see when he when he's going to be like on fire. Yeah. And um, or I love it when you know people start having a go at him and he's just like watch this and just goes next level. I just love watching him play. Um, and so it's like athletes like that. You're like wow. Like this is this is incredible. Like this is a great, and so that that's why I'm still so involved in different sports. Um, but then also too, I guess, sort of mentor um, or help different people out along the way, um, especially in, in surfing or whatever. Um, but you relearn a lot of it, mm. and you relearn the things that you really like, and that's super cool as well and so like you sort of get a a personal connection to an athlete you're like it doesn't matter what sport it is all athletes have very similar sort of um, processes and and goals and all that sort of stuff Um, but yeah you hit you have vested interest in one or two athletes and it just makes it that much more enjoyable oh definitely yeah yeah. Yeah. and you, you you just look at they're um doesn't matter if they win or lose or whatever it's freaking awesome when they win but if they you know they're working on something yeah and you see that come out yeah like that for me is like a huge like fuck yes <laughs> yeah 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 and and seeing i guess like sport is such a like there's so much human nature on display and there's so much that you can take from sport like into your life it's almost like this crucible where you're just like you're taking all you're like enhancing all of the elements of like everything you'd have to live in your own like the wider life and then you're boiling it down to like 80 minutes of footy or you know like a heat or you know the tennis is a great example and same as golf man like you remember back in the day just those like rounds where tiger was just locked in and it was just foot on the gas pedal and he was just belting people by like 10 strokes for the you know for the the weekend you're just like dude how can you stay so zoned in for just like four five six hours at a time and doing it four days in a row like and and to i guess you can see the areas that those things could just apply to like the wider life that you live. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing watching people like that. I guess for, for me, you know, especially in my early years, I was like front row and center with guys like Andy Irons and Kelly Mm. Slater and, and seeing them, how switched on they could be like being really honest. There's a lot of the times where it was just, it was pretty much a two person tour yeah. and everyone else was just creating the fluff that goes with it. So those guys can just smoke everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that was so good. And they were so switched on when they were switched on untouchable, untouchable. What was different between Kelly and Andy? Because it's like they both could do the same thing. So like the tip of the spear is winning a world title or like winning pipeline or like winning an event. So the end point is the same but they almost seemed like two different people. Like, were they super different? Were they more similar than people think? Um, no, they were really different. Yeah. Um, Andy was, Andy surfed on all emotion, mm. all emotion. Like, you could be his best mate. He put on that wet shirt, and he'll bring something up where you might have beaten him in Scrabble, or you might have beaten yeah. him in this or that. And he's yeah. like, Fuck you, yeah. and just wanted to kill you. Like proper kill you like i remember being in a heat and he's swearing at me i'm like mate we're staying in the same room (laughs) (laughs) where kelly was (laughs) kelly would just go really i guess deep within himself and he just had this 
he's just got this competitor in his own brain that he's trying to beat the whole time. And, and, and so the way that he would just, he just want to not only beat the person that he was against, but he wanted to beat himself so bad that he would just embarrass everyone else because he was so good. (laughs) And, but those two, yeah, very different chalk and cheese. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's sort of competed really differently. Um, like, yeah, I'd always, I'd always do my best not to piss Andy off before a heat because you'd just be super, super nice because he couldn't, he would start forgetting <laughs> all, <laughs> all the ways that he hates yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> but then, yeah, he was just, he was just next level. Like, yeah. He, him and, yeah. And Kelly, Kelly's just one of those freaks, man. He was just so naturally gifted. Yeah. Um, and just, yeah, just truly embarrass people from what i know of kelly too though he takes that same energy into golf he takes that same energy into jiu-jitsu like everything everything casey stone is very similar yeah like casey's got that mind where like you playing golf with him it's like my angle of attack my club face was this my you know like it's so zoned in on literally everything that he's doing and like that's a that's such a weird genetic <laughs> mutation or yeah. like whatever's going on there yeah i don't know i don't know um you know i i i'm pretty competitive too um but yeah like when i was in my competitive years i would be like that if i if i wasn't winning i was like fuck this i'm not playing <laughs> 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 but, where, but kelly's in yeah he's just everything that he does um, even if it's conversation, sometimes he wants to try and beat you in that. <laughs> it's like, hey, come on. <laughs> but no, it, it's, yeah, I don't know. There, there's some freak freak athletes and freak people that that's just the way they're, they're wired and that's how they get through life. And, um, yeah, it's it's pretty incredible to see when it all comes together and they're, they're on point in their thing. Yeah, that well, I think Pipeline, when Kelly won 50 years old, like at that point, you just... That, that's like literally him in one day, really. Yeah. And you could, like, even speaking to the, um, like, I was speaking to Seth, who got second in that event. Yeah. And he reckons he paddled out and he said that Kelly wasn't even there. You know, he was just in, and that's the Kelly of old. Like, we used to deal with that day in, day out. Really? And, um, yeah, he would just, it just felt like he was just on a different planet. Yeah, and he just was, so like internal almost. Yeah, but he would he would still talk or whatever. But he's just things just happen, and it feels like he was just moving the ocean. Or, <laughs> yeah, you know the um or like yeah, the, he would be talking to lips and stuff of their barreling over him. Like things just happened, and um, it was so cool to see that once more. Did you have many of those? moments like i remember in your book you were talking about the there was a heat in france and it was like pretty important for world title implications and then there was like i'm pretty sure you're saying that was a heat where you felt like your brother was like literally just sending you waves and sending you like you won that heat and everything just fully lined up perfectly in in that way like there was dolphins in the lineup like the whole deal yeah that was in brazil yeah oh brazil Um, sorry yeah and um yeah it's sort of Sometimes you just have those moments and you're in the zone and things just happen. Like you don't think, um, you just like some people call it the zone. Some people call it flow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, some pe- there's so many different names for it, but, um, yeah, you just, the brain just gets left on the beach and you're just feeling and reacting and, um, yeah, just not thinking. And, you know, to get into that, situation it's oh man there's there's no better feeling um especially when you're surfing or um competing because everything just happens around it's so you. easy at that point it's easy yeah. easy yeah. yeah um so yeah that's that's the that was like a goal that you would always try and get to and the moment you start thinking about it yeah. you're out of it yeah you know yeah. it just it's such a minute thing was there many times that it happened for you? Like, were you a dude that went into that that place like regularly, or? Um, look, it probably happened. Oh, off the top of my head, probably 
maybe 15, 20 times yeah, okay. throughout my career. Yeah. Um, and yeah, things would just, yeah, just come together. You wouldn't feel like you'd, sometimes you just, you wouldn't f- feel that great paddling out for a heat. And then all of a sudden it would just click in and you're just like, oh, this is amazing. You know, but you almost can't talk about it or think about it or like in the moment, even to yourself, because it's like, you just don't want it to go away. Yeah, no. And as soon as you do start thinking about it, it's gone and you're like, I want to get back there. Like, I guess it's sort of like heroin for a drug addict. You know, they want to get back to that first initial hit. Um, Yeah. um, So it's, yeah, it's such an, an, an incredible feeling and it's addictive to get there, but it's, yeah, it only happens when it, I don't know. I don't know the science behind it or whatever yeah. but yeah it doesn't happen that many times i was talking to sam hill on the podcast and he's like uh, from perth uh downhill mountain bike dude he was like the goat man like this dude he come on the scene no one knew who the fuck he was and he just like went over to europe and he was winning races where guys were guys were winning by like 0.2 you know half a second and he showed up and started beating dudes by like 10 seconds wow just from from out of nowhere and he was saying that he he remembers like it's funny so you threw out like 15 to 20 and he's like eight i had eight runs where i was just not even there just fully like watching myself do the gnarliest shit and it was at eight times wow. like it's so funny that people at that you know super super high level have like a fairly vivid recollection of like the times where like yeah that that was it yeah it's yeah because it doesn't happen that often and yeah you come in and you feel so good (laughs) you just want to stay out there forever and um yeah but but also too there would be different feelings with it yeah sometimes it would be like um an aggressive feel with it or sometimes it would just be like pure flow like light out of body and then other times it would just be like laughing your ass off like it would always be different um so yeah it's i I don't know i don't know how to if we could bottle it up and give it to people it would be amazing yeah i was listening to a podcast with Corey sandhagen and uh, i don't are you a ufc Yeah, yeah yeah so he was talking about um he was saying that the the fight that he had with cheeto he just said there was just full like out of body so like he was watching him himself do it and like imagine being in that scenario in that that level it's like and real physical consequence i mean surfing has real physical consequences like as UFC. well but, <laughs> but like yeah those staring down that barrel can you imagine the application of like that state of mind in a fucking ufc fight oh, too crazy and that i guess yeah I guess that's sort of how you gotta you gotta be in those situations, you know. It's life or death, fight or flight. Um, yeah, uh, like I always sort of think of how, like people that go into war and stuff like mm. that. Like, is that how they get ready for that? Um, because yeah, if you make the wrong thought or something, and that's death in war. So um, yeah, it's it's a it's a crazy crazy thing, but. Um, yeah, an incredible experience if you get to ever experience it. Yeah. And so, are you finding that in golf these days? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> you probably went from like the most flow, like soulful, like in the moment, the evidence of the most like, fuck, fuck, yeah, fuck. Yeah, yeah. Um, nah, golf's hard. It's funny, like I sit there and like I look at the ball and I'm like, I've got too many thoughts going through yeah, my head. Yeah. Is this right? This right? This right? This. And I think that's what happens with most people who play golf. But then, I like it. It moves too slow. Yeah. But then I was asking um, Ash Barty once about it, and she's like, "I love golf so much because it's slow. Mm. Where tennis is just so fast. So yeah, it's just so yin and yang of, of you know." I always love the flow of sport, so I don't have to think. Yeah, yeah. She, she loves sitting and thinking about it, which yeah. is cool. What um is she still going pro in in golf? Like, was that her plan when she retired? I think it was maybe rumors. I don't, oh, okay. I don't know. I because she's like her. crazy good at golf. Too, oh, she's right? amazing. Yeah, yeah. She's incredible, dude. What a freak. Yeah, she's she is one of those freaks. Just um, just incredible at, at sport. Yeah. You know, golf, tennis cricket whatever um but just legend legend 
Legend chick. So, how long have you been playing golf for now? Like, because so you were ag- not against it, but you like fought the golf thing because it's been like pretty big in the golf world for a while. Like, you go into all these places mm. and boys take their clubs and, and have a whack. Yeah. Um, no, I sort of, we won. It's funny. I, I sort of had, I started playing back in 2007. Yeah. In 2006, we had an event at Trestles and it was a teams event and it was country versus country. Yeah. And um, Taj and I were surfing for Australia, but it was whoever won that country, all the surfers on the team, like like on the whole tour, got a set of golf clubs. Oh. And Taj and I are pretty much the only ones that don't play golf. <laughs> <laughs> and so we've got like all the all the boys are sitting around us and giving Just us so, pumping yeah, us up. so much pressure. Oh. And I'm like, we don't even like golf. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we all won clubs and I was like, oh, well, shit, I better use them. I yeah. got the brand new clubs and... And, um, so I started for about a year and then I just gave up. Um, and then my next one was 2019, the end of 2019, um, got invited by Ash to go and play in the Pro-Am and the President's Cup. Oh, dude. And, yeah. Where was it? It was in Melbourne. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, it was like, I was like, oh, you know what? I don't play golf. And then it was, the team was going to be George Gregan, oh. Lorne, Stop and, it. And Ash, I was like, oh, that's the dream team. Put me in, coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so I had two months to to learn how to play golf. And then I was doing it while recovering from ACL surgery. So okay. I was just shit. <laughs> yeah. I'm so glad we didn't have to play in front of um in front of people because I was so bad. Like even worse than I am now. Fuck. That's yeah, yeah that, that that's a hectic feeling too. Yeah. Like when you're standing over the ball and you're like you got a driver or whatever club that you're just not with and you're yeah. like, I don't have a chance of fucking hitting this no. thing. But I gotta hit <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, I gotta hit it just cause but yeah, no, it was pretty pretty awesome. Dude, we went to the President's Cup in must have been seventeen. It's every two years, right? I think so, yeah. Must have been 17 in New York. Yeah, wow. And, uh, yeah, dude, it was sick. Like, we had a boat on the Hudson River, and then yeah. we kind of, like, watched it from the river for a couple of days. Wow. And then we went on the last day to watch you. I was with a bunch of Americans, and we went to watch um, Team USA close it out. And, dude, Trump right there. Yeah, right. Like, we were literally next, next to Trump watching this thing, and there was fucking snipers in the grass on the fairway like the no. whole it was the most heavy deal wow man. that's wild that's wild it's yeah golf's far out are you in now though i play a bit um it doesn't take up all my world i'll, I'll play when there's no surf yeah okay. yeah yeah but you're not just straight geeking like the rest of the boys no nah, not that bad not yeah. that bad although yeah. i do have a golf simulator <laughs> but everyone else uses it more than me <laughs> that's so good yeah. what one did you get uh, the CG3 one. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Or GC3. GC3, yeah, yeah. that's the one. Yeah, yeah that's the yeah. go. So when you, you go from uh, finishing like full-time career in surfing and then you've been pretty active business-wise. So am I right in saying that your mum and you did all of your own management and stuff through, through your career? Yeah. Did that like pretty well stay the same like throughout and then post? Because you've made some pretty solid decisions when it comes to like business and investments. Yeah. Um, yeah, we sort of... Uh, core Nucleus was, yeah, mum. So that how it all came about, my mum was um, director of nursing um, up at... Um, was it Narang Hospital? Yeah. And she was going for a new job and she was super stressed about it. And you're like, Mum, we're rich, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, and I'm just like, Mum, look, if if you don't get the job, just come work for me. Um, and before that, I, I came home one day when I was like 16 or so, and I was like, Mum, do you think we need a manager? And she pretty much goes, you're an idiot. You're smart enough to look after your own stuff. So I sort of like, all right, we'll go there. And then she came on board because things were starting to get a bit too busy. And um, in the end, she didn't get the job, um, came and worked for me. And it was just me and her just doing it all. And so it was it was great. She was, um, you know, the lioness we call her. That's um, so sick. Yeah. <laughs> and so she's protecting her cubs, you know. Yeah. Um, and then... And then as time went on, 
um, started getting really busy in the in the media world and all that. So brought on um, Ronnie Blakey. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so Ronnie does um, all my media, um, and but also he. Um, helps with or outside of surfing sort of deals. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty much it. We have had uh, lawyers, tax accountants and all yeah, that sort of stuff yeah, yeah. that would go and sit with. And But, yeah, that was pretty much it. Um, and, yeah, look, you say there was, yeah, there's been some really good decisions. There's been some crap ones too. <laughs> We're, but that's the way we learn. Yeah, and I, it. Yeah. yeah, and because I'm fully immersed in it, I can say, okay, that was crap. I'm not doing that again. Or... Um, and a lot of it, I think, is more just going off feeling, having a look at the people who um, are running these companies or, you know, what the company is about and just going off feeling. Yeah. Um, if it felt right, then get in. You know, some have failed due to different circumstances. But, um, yeah, been lucky enough that I can walk out of most um, most deals with a good relationship with who I was working with. Yeah. Did you, like, you obviously had an interest in it because there's, there's two trains of thought, right? It's like, I just want to focus on surfing. I just want to be like the, the athlete. That's what I'm taking care of. Like you take care of the rest. Um, or then there's, I guess it takes like a different kind of athlete to really care about the business side and like kind of want to be a part of like doing those deals, you know? Um, no, like at the start, all I wanted to do was just surf. Yeah. Um, didn't want to deal with it. Um, but it's, you know, when you, with a company for, um, you know, I've been with Ripcal now since I was 16. So, um, what's that? 26 years now. Wow. No, even more. Fuck, I don't know. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, 26 years, I think. Um, but anyway, we, you get to a point where those People don't want to speak to your manager. They want to know the athlete. Yeah, yeah. And, and I feel like me going in and saying, you know, this is why I want this deal, this is why I want this and that, they can they can believe that. Yeah. And you create a relationship with them. It's like, hey, you've said you're going to do this. Why aren't you doing that? And I'm like, well, you hear it so many times where a manager goes, we want this, this, and this. And then the athlete's like, oh, really? Do we have to do that? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I think that sort of helped me get, get longevity out that of this. That does make boxes. sense, yeah. Um, and, but also too, like if you're, if you're going to sponsor an athlete, you want to talk to the athlete, Yeah. you know? I don't want to talk to a manager and go through three different people to get to the athlete, you know? Yeah. You know, what shirt do you want to wear? You know? <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. Do you like these board shorts? Yeah. Do you not like these yeah. board shorts? You don't need to go through an email chain to get to those people. So yeah, um, and it's not hard. And I think it sort of it it takes a lot of questions out. Um, you know, oh, massively, eh? Yeah, like going toing and throwing with all that sort of stuff. And so. then the the trust as well, like especially if it's your mum, like yeah, mum is you know, just to have that level of trust in a person to yeah. just be like, we're sweet. Yeah, and you know, as I said, she's the lioness, so <laughs> she's always going to protect her cubs. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, you know, even to this day, like she's she's across everything. Yeah, um, and knows what's what's happening. Um, and but. You know, if I go into a, a contract with negotiations with someone that I've been with forever, it's pretty much just me walking in and yeah. saying this, this is what we're going to do. And yeah. um, and then she'll look over the contract, make sure there's no hidden gems. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. But look, it's... it's. Um, I think also too, like you... When you are just concentrating on your sport, you get to a point after doing it for so long, you're like, oh, I need something else to yeah. invite in. And, yeah. and that's sort of where I got a little bit more involved. It's like, I can still do all these things and compartmentalize when I don't need them. Yeah. And it's uh, almost be like a welcome distraction at a point. It is. Yeah. Cause there's a lot of downtime too on tour. Mm. You, you know, the event goes for 10 days. You've only got, uh, I guess you surf three, four days. Yeah. So there's a lot of downtime. Yeah, yeah, no, it doesn't make sense. So, do you have like a a cool moment or story? Like, say your mum's going for that. I'm guessing shit job that you didn't want her to get anyway. But 
was it cool watching her life change and maybe even before that like you like you said you didn't really grow up with that much money like to be able to help her and like let her live a better life than maybe she thought she would have lived into her you know like older age was it cool to sort of be able to set your mum up like that yeah yeah like um you yeah look i've never been one to like sit there and and worry about money yeah um i guess if i get a dollar i'll probably spend a dollar <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um uh, i yeah don't let me know how much is in the bank account because i'll go and buy some but, um, <laughs> yeah. but i'm not buying stupid shit i'm just like i was just i just yeah, always looking at property or something like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty cool to know that she can just go about her days and look after the grandkids or, yeah. you know, if she's needed overseas with other family and stuff like that, she can go and buy a flight and do that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, being able to yeah buy my dad a, a house and stuff like that, like, it's pretty cool to, to see and, and know that they're okay yeah. um, and don't have to stress yeah. on money because, yeah, it's... I know for some people, it's it's not a, a very nice feeling for sure when they have to stress about those things. So to be able to give back and um, say, yeah, you're going to be okay. Don't stress about yeah. it. it. It's all good. Yeah, because that was one thing when I read your book that I, I almost felt like I had a... a, like a connection with your mum in a sense you know like yeah. it really seemed like she she was like one of the stars of you know like that story which is your story and um yeah it was just so cool to kind of like see the progression of you know like the way that you know driving you guys to the beach for the you know hour or whatever that it took and then it's like that in with zero uh expectation of like your mum didn't grow up as the kind of mum that was like my kid's going to be the world champion. My no. kid's going to be a professional surfer. My kid's going to, you know, because for some people, like, that is a bit of a dream. And I just think it was such, like, a beautiful story arc to, like, see that here's this woman that had, you know, these crazy sacrifices and, and struggled for so much of her life. And then you fast forward 25 years and it's just, like, you know, almost like life really gave back to her in a way. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, her, her and dad, they... They tried their hardest for us, um, and and yeah, look, there were times where it was real tough. Um, you know, Mum always said that we've got to have a, a house near the beach because if we're if the boys are in the ocean, they're out of trouble. Yeah, yeah. And so you know, her just making those decisions it's changed our world. And um, you've got no responsibility for for that, eh? No. Nah. And and then my dad on the other side, like he's just staunch Irishman. Yeah. Still wears pants and, and a shirt. And, you know, he would come and he half the time he I don't think he knows what <laughs> what's happening out in the surf half the time. He's just like, Well, that was a good wave, so give him that many points. But yeah. Um but yeah, he would just show up and he was just so proud of of us all just for giving it a go and um yeah. And he would just show up in his pants and jeans and everyone would be like, I think that's your dad. <laughs> the only person that would dress like that at a surf comp, you know. That's <laughs> so, so good. Yeah. So it's pretty cool to um see how proud they are of not only myself but the whole family and um and go and just yeah enjoy enjoy the decisions that they made that it's coming full circle for them yeah did you have any like kind of weird experiences when you went to not weird experience probably like a weird way to say it, but like you go to ireland where you're from and it's like your heritage the first time you ever went there did you have any like kind of feelings come up that because i know for me like my parents my family's scottish mm -hmm. but zero connection to scotland at all yeah but the first time i went there and was like i remember i was like looking at these mountains in the scottish highlands like we just we were driving and then i was like fuck pulled over stopped the car and just stood and then that was like there was a really crazy feeling that came over me i was like fuck, i did not expect to have any type of feelings about this place at all and there there was something that was like actually quite deep there like did you have that when you went to Ireland or yeah in a sense yeah so like I guess traveling around the world you go into these 
places, you know, especially like Hawaii is probably the biggest one where you, you're always going to be a tourist. Yeah. You know, or you go to Indo, you're going to be a tourist. Like always be a tourist. Doesn't matter if you buy a house there, you live there, yeah. you're always a tourist. Yeah. Um, and I go back to Ireland and you sort of almost feel a sense of belonging. Yeah. You know, this is, this is where my family's from. And so uh, almost like, um, this is, yeah, I feel like I can connect a little bit more. Um, don't feel like I'm a tourist in yeah, every single yeah, situation, yeah. which yeah. is like even here in Australia, sometimes I feel like a tourist. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's, I don't know, you, you, I feel like a, a calmness in that side of things, yeah. um, which is nice. Yeah. Um, you know, it's strange though when you've like never really even been to the place before or whatever you know like the first time you go then you can actually feel that yeah no funny funny story like you know Ireland's such a small place and we were we landed I was with um Hedgie and Parker and mate Shags and um we were driving and we're driving from Belfast up to where my family is from um right then have you still got family there yeah yeah oh yeah, sick yeah um and so we're driving along and you know we're on the highway and this car comes up next to us and just starts waving at us and i'm just like oh this is weird like (laughs) people are friendly in ireland and then it just kept coming and and waving and this and that and we're like this is getting weird boys like what's going on and anyway um we're driving along and then all of a sudden we just see one of the board bags just open up and jackets and everything fly out. Oh. So we pull over the side of the road and the guy that was waving with us pulled over as well. And we're like, Oh shit, what's going <laughs> this on is here? This, yeah, this, yeah, is, yeah. this is a bit weird. And, um, and I just run off down the street. I'm like, I'm not dealing with this. <laughs> I'm just run off down the street to grab the jackets and stuff like that. And um, I get back and the boys are laughing their ass off and they're like, that's your bloody cousin. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> no shit. Yeah, because I didn't have any photos or anything. No way. Yeah, and uh, so we just ran into my cousin and he found us on the highway. He's like, oh, I'll drive you home. <laughs> no, is yeah. that where you were going? Yeah, we're going. No yeah, way. Yeah, it was hilarious. It's hilarious. So yeah, that, that is a small island yeah. at that point. Have you been back much since? A few times, yeah. 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 Um, I went, um i think i've been there four five times yeah Yeah. so yeah it's 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 cool every time i go there it just um you learn something new but also just yeah you have that sense of belonging yeah well when you when you were at like the peak of fame going through like winning the world titles what was your relationship like that like you talked about you got blakey doing some of the like external pr stuff like how did what was your view on it or how did you feel about it because you, you talked to some guys and they just didn't want a part of it it's like I, I just there to ride or surf or whatever like i don't want to deal with it and there's other guys that like kind of embrace it like where did you fit on that spectrum um look it's it's part of the job yeah. in some sense um but also too there's part of it where i just wanted to just be me um you know i guess probably the the peak the peak of it all was after the um the shark incident where oh yeah there were camera crews just lined up out the front of my house what yeah and and i was just like i don't want this i don't want this um you know i just want to get on with it i want to get on with life and and that part of it i was just like no where and ronnie knew he was just like he knows what I'm like. Yeah. He would always he would always ask the question, do you want to do this or do you want to do that? And he wouldn't fight me. Oh, you should. Yeah. You know, yeah. He'd be, I'd be like, oh, I don't really want to. Or if I was a bit unsure, I was like, what do you think? You know. Um, but there were situations, especially around that time, where like we got offered to get flown to LA and do talk shows and all that kind of stuff. It's like, nah, we're not doing it. <laughs> I'm over it. Um, but yeah, it is part of the job. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you go, you've got to, you got to take it. Yeah. You got to know at that times for yeah, sure. Yeah. How was that whole shark deal? Like, did that almost feel like the biggest thing in your 
career in a sense or like because there would be some people that would only know you yeah for that you know which is such a crazy thing to think because it's like here's this dude that's achieved as much as anybody ever that's ever paddled into a wave on a surfboard and then like that's the thing yeah it sort of that situation sort of hit me a few different times um one was you know flying home from south africa and Julian and I get whisked straight into a, a press conference as we land. Who organised it? Um, I don't even know. I was so <laughs> off the planet. Um, but when you you land and it's and I look out at who's there, and it's the biggest anchors in every different network, and I'm just like in Australia. Um, they were international was... as well. Okay. We, we flew into Sydney. Okay, yeah. But I was just like, holy shit, this is bigger than what I thought. Um, and so, yeah, that was part of it. Like, that was the media side of it. And then um, a couple of months later, I'm flying to, to Trestles for uh, an event. And, like, I could easily walk through um, LAX, LAX and be and- sweet. No one would ever recognize me. Yeah. And I'm just walking up the ramp and some guy looked like he'd never been to the beach before in his life. He just goes, <laughs> hey, shark guy. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> I was just like, Heavy. Uh, yeah. Um, and yeah, look, some people look at it as, um, you know, that's the only thing that happened in my career, but you know, I know who I am. I yeah. I look at it just as an incident, and um, yeah, I don't need external people to tell me what was good or what was bad. Like, yeah, I, I know, <laughs> dude. I remember watching that live. Like, I was literally watching the live stream of that heat, and I'm was screaming at the thing. I was like, no, no, no. Like, yeah. it was that was such a fucking heavy because it was so live. Yeah, <laughs> like as live as a sporting event gets you know there's like no delays there's no like everyone saw that in real time yeah. and i remember sitting there thinking like they're fucking dead yeah. and that it was one of the it was such a weird experience to be like on the other because normally if that was like a nfl or you know it's like something like that happened like yeah you, it's on enough of a delay to where like you wouldn't really see it like they could they could but that whole thing just went and it was fucking heavy yeah it was it was weird like i guess also too like um like when it happened like we jumped on the boat and we're so full of adrenaline we're just so psyched yeah (laughs) we didn't know what was going on and and you know we come in on the beach and um like i was like let's just paddle in let's just get out of here and and um yeah go home and it wasn't until I got back to the competitors area and just saw everyone bawling their eyes out. Yeah. Like, holy shit. And then I saw the footage. I was like, holy shit. And then um, I sort of, you know, I was still running on fight or flight in that situation. And it wasn't until I ran into um, a friend, um, a, a wife of Ace Bucken. Yeah, um, yeah. Bet Bucken. And... I saw her and she was sort of like the first motherly figure I saw. I fucking crumbled. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine. Yeah, it. just almost fell to the ground and barely walked. Like, it was wild. But, yeah, it wasn't until I got to the beach and everyone was there and um, sort of saw their reactions. Yeah. Um, like, I don't know. If I never saw the footage, Yeah, maybe I would have been that guy being macho man or something. But, yeah, once I saw her, I was like, holy shit. Yeah, dude. And just the fact that it was live. Yeah. Everyone could see it. Yeah. You know, like it just wasn't... Even like the impact of it, if it was only the people at the event that saw it and it never got like broadcasted, it'd be just like a totally different thing. But just like that feeling of like so many people being on the other side of the screen, like feeling helpless in that situation. It was like... it's It's a very strange situation to have happen you oh, know like for sure. even for the people on the other side of screens yeah like speaking to mum and, and family and friends about it like they were just like mum tried to jump through the screen oh I, yeah. I can't even um, imagine yeah but it's yeah it was just weird it was super weird dude Jules gets man of the 
like world award <laughs> yeah. like if there's like a litman's test of like are you a man yeah <laughs> and it's like you either swim away from the shark or you swim towards the oh. shark jules you pass flying yeah. goals. i know i was yelling at him too i was like go 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 um but yeah he was just charging on and yeah had so brave and courageous like that's yeah always indebted in in yeah. that sense you know have you had you had any other shark encounters before see them yeah you know but not like that not like that no yeah. like yeah it's a pretty no. wild edge case yeah. <laughs> it's like the worst case scenario yeah yeah and I, I was extremely lucky it was yeah it's just one of those ones where you just like just got lucky yeah yeah no it was it was i think the next thing once everyone was like holy fuck we almost watched mcfain die everyone was just like how good is it to be an Aussie? <laughs> <laughs> like that was that was like the yeah. next thing where I was like, "Fuck, I'm one of those boys, kind of." It's kind of sorta. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it it was weird. Like we had, um, we had a barbecue that night at my house. It was like going to your own wake. <laughs> it was Dude. so weird. It was like everyone be laughing right for you know, you know, having so much fun. And then all of a sudden, you'd look around, everyone would be bawling their eyes out. It was it was so weird. It was so weird. But Dude. Yeah, you know, I was yeah very lucky to be surrounded by people that really cared and, and um, yeah, supported me getting home, for sure. Yeah. Uh, all right, switch topics. Um, nice. So, <laughs> with, the, uh, with the, the business stuff, right? So, I think, for me, anyway, like what I remember was Bolter. Like that was for me, like the first big business move. It was like you and a bunch of the, the other boys that went into that. And then obviously like years down the track, it gets, it gets bought out. That's a pretty big success story. But did you ever treat business or did you look at business as like another competitive outlet in a sense or similar to maybe competitive is not the right word, but is similar in that sense? Oh, very similar. Yeah. I thought it was, um, you know, I think business is one of those things you get out what you put in. Mm, similar um, to sport. Yeah. Um, you know, and you, it's it's very similar in the fact that you might have, say, the athlete or the product, and then you've got to build the dream team around that to, you know, go and help them achieve what they want. Um, and that's pretty much, you know, you got the, the bolter can. That's, that's pretty much what we did yeah we we handpicked the people that we wanted to be in there um and we handpicked them for a few different reasons you know a they were amazing at their job but b they all had similar attributes where they were never going to be bigger than the brand yeah yeah um and or you're not bigger than any other person in that brand. Yeah. So like you walk in there and everyone's very, very humble. Um, you know, our CEO, Ant Macca, uh, he's incredible. Like he was my favorite um, team manager. And, but even to this day, if he doesn't know what any part of the business, he'll go and learn it. Yeah. And he'll go and learn it with the crew. And, and so that, that humbleness is, I think that's what sets the culture in, in Bolter. And I think that's why people really enjoy it. Yeah. Um, obviously the beer, beer is amazing. Thanks <laughs> to Scott Hargraves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, everyone really came together and um, everyone sort of knew their role. And um, yeah, it was just, you know, you can uh, have those situations in different businesses. This one popped off. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you think it was going to go the way that it did? Because, like, man, it just exploded, eh? Yeah. Oh, look, as soon as we had the beer, we're like, this is really good beer. Um, <laughs> I remember exactly we had a tasting night at my house um, during a state of origin. That's and, a solid time. To, yeah. like, that's a really great test of is this beer good? Yeah. And, um, yeah, a few people rang up the next day and like, who won? <laughs> they could remember that. Um, but yeah, every, it was just so nice to taste and just, um, yeah, Scotty's a magician when it comes to making beer. And how involved were you boys in that, in that process? Like, cause I guess a couple of years kind of retired around the same sort of time. So it's like everyone just sort of like poured their focus into it or. Yeah. Um, no, we're, we're very, um, you know, very involved. Like we were, as I said, we were helping plan 
who was taking what role. Yeah. Um, you know, we used to have meetings. What's the can going to look like? Um, you know, figure out a name. Um, you know, everyone was in there all the time. Uh, one of the first ever, we delivered the fa- first kegs ourselves. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, and then I remember Parker and I were on the on the canning line for the, one of the very first days, gluing boxes and all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, we sort of just it's one of those places that like say if we even if we go in there today and there's a, a spill on the floor or you know they need an extra bartender or or whatever if they ask us we're in that's sick yeah. so you're, you're still like that involved in yeah it. yeah and like um you know we we try and know everyone that works there um yeah. and that's i think that's the beauty of it is that it's very humble throughout no one's better than anyone um, where do you think that came from Oh, it came from the top. Yeah. You know, Ant and, and Stirls and Scotty. Um, and as are like, they're very humble people and they're very, you know, driven in what they do. But, um, yeah, it's it's very, uh, yeah, I think, I think it all comes, if, see, if you see, I was a dickhead. Yeah, Most yeah, people yeah. in the business can probably be a dickhead. So yeah. you've got <laughs> yeah. to try and weed that out and make sure that everyone the culture's right yeah when when did you i guess like first learn about the utility of humility um oh it's a pretty underrated skill i think or under uh, underrated trait it, well surfing you get humility you, <laughs> you get humbled you, a lot. humbled so <laughs> yeah. much and you and you like um yeah you know you could be ripping you could be biggest hero in the world and then all of a sudden the ocean will just smash you down yeah um so that that happens day in day out for me um but then i remember specifically um i was at a a junior event and um i should have got through this heat and i cracked the shits punched (laughs) my board i was blown up yeah and i walked up to the dunes thinking you know thinking mum was gonna back me up she goes you ever act like that again i'm gonna slap you in the head (laughs) and i was like wow okay (laughs) and so that sort of um that sort of you know sportsmanship and stuff like that that's where that came from yeah and was there ever a thing too where like because you with a pretty tight crew with like you and and parker and you know like you had a kind of crew of guys you'd sort of grown up with aussies have a way of just like hammering each other yeah like in your friend group oh. and i think that it's pretty uh maybe other cultures don't have it in the way that we do but i really feel like there's something in that to like the level of humility that, oh, sure. that, that you get out of that, For right? Sure. Like even to this day, you're writing your mates off. Like yeah. I just did a boat trip to Indo and everyone's just writing each other off for 10 days straight. And like, yeah. Sometimes I sit there and I'm like, why are we even friends? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's that's the beauty of uh, Aussie humility. And um, and yeah, it's I think that's what keeps us grounded. Yeah. What was it like having a crew like that to, to come up with too? Because that's such a, I guess, like a lightning in a bottle type of scenario to have like the coolie kids and, you know, growing up, everyone's super talented. You're super tight mates. Like you're all kind of, you know, helping each other get to comps and stuff. You go all the way through your career together. That's that's a pretty special little group to be a oh, part of. Incredible. Um, you know, I've said it before and I'll say it again, without Dean and Joel, I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, you know, those those two guys pushed, pushed n- not only myself, but I think we all pushed each other um, to just be better and better each and every time. We had sort of like this leapfrog effect where, mm. you know, Dean would be, you know, winning everything this week and then Joel would come over the top of him and win everything the following week and then I would go the one after and we'll just keep going like that um but i think also too like especially in those early days on tour because we're all traveling together or you know we're all learning it together it was almost like a confidence booster yeah like you see some athletes they come on and they're young and they don't have that support group or that friend group and they sort of 
feel like they're not ready to be there but when all three of you that are together it's yeah like, it sort yeah, of doesn't matter no nah, we're like oh, i'm just well we didn't even really focus on trying to beat this guy or that guy it's like i don't care about the ratings if i'm beating joel and dean i'm yeah, i'm yeah, winning yeah that's my yeah, world title yeah, yeah, and yeah. they looked at it the same so yeah. um that was yeah i think that's what pushed us as hard as we could was it unique to the time? Like, were there other crews that were there in a similar way? or? Well, there was, you know, I guess before that, there was the momentum generation where it's like Kelly, mm. Rob Machado, yep. Yep. Kyle and yep. Ox, um, and they sort of did that. But they weren't all from the same town. Yeah, They were just a group of Americans traveling together, getting filmed by Taylor Steele and trying yep. to push each other to make the best movies. Where, yeah, we sort of, yeah, we were all sat at the same bench at school when we went to school. And then um, and then we'd surf with each other each and every day. Um, so it was a little different, but, um, you know, there's the, you got to pay respects to the OG Cooler Kids, which is like Michael Peterson, yeah. Rabbit Bath on yeah. you and, and Peter Tan. And um, those were the OG ones. And I think it's sort of just, Every now and then you'll get those different groups in different towns that just push each other to next level. What What is it about the Goldie you think that produces so much talent? Because, I mean, there there's other places that get a bunch of waves. Like, what what do you think it was in, um, in particular? Just easy. Yeah. Life was easy. Like, when I lived in Ballina, surfing wasn't that fun. I would just get smashed all the time. And then I moved to the Gold Coast. And, wow, this is so easy. Um, the points are easy. Waves are always good. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's sort of, it's a great breeding ground. Um, but also too, it has that, I guess, um, it has a dark side to it too, where it's too easy. Mm. Where, you know, when things get hard, some people are just like, ah, I'm just going home. Mm. And we see that, I think it's not only just in surfing, but there's a, you know, sometimes there's different sports where it just doesn't, doesn't yeah. mesh right. Yeah. Um, till people find the grit and, and keep wanting to work at it. So um, as amazing as, as it is, there is, yeah, you've, it does get too easy and it can have the adverse effect. It, was there kids that, you grew up surfing with where you're like fuck I'll never be this guy and no one's ever heard of him um oh there's still kids to this day like you know for when snappers on there's there's a handful of guys that best in the world when really? it comes to that wave you know like um and it's yeah it's it's but they've never gone on and yeah. done anything outside the area really um you know so it's sort of yeah, it's tough to see, but um, that's you know it happens all around the world, like places like Pipeline and stuff like that. There's specific crew that incredible at that one spot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when it comes to you know having to go and do the hard work elsewhere, it's just like it's easier at home. Yeah, because you'll see that. I mean, even me growing up racing, like there was dudes that. So one guy in particular. So that like, we grew up with. Uh, a crew of guys, they all went to race professionally. I ended up doing the video thing. Um, but there was like a guy that would fucking smoke them. Mm. <laughs> Just like t had the most like crazy natural talent, natural style, like win everything. Had well off parents that could actually afford to do it because it's an expensive sport. Yeah. And, like the dude literally did nothing. He drives excavators now. Yeah. And he was like, bro, you were so gnarly. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's sad to see, like, um, but you know that's I guess it's the same in all kinds of different worlds. You know, business worlds the same. Or, yeah, yeah, I suppose. You, know, you see, trust fund kids just turn into derelicts. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So there's there's all kinds of different ways. You you got to have that determination inside. Yeah. Did you get to spend much time in Oz when you were on tour? Like, was Oz the place that you would always? base yourself and come back to or did you spend like time in california or like or you were always based here no i'd always base out yep. of out of cooley um it was yeah so got any time whatsoever fly home yeah reset go again 
Um, but in saying that, we're probably on to a, probably nine months out of the year on yep. the road. Yeah. Um, but yeah, any any opportunity to come home, we came home. Is there, a, if you had to live in another country, where would it be? Ooh, that's hard. Because um, Aussie is fucking good. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's crazy good. Know. Well, my wife's from California, so we've been spending a few months each year over there. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's it's fine there. Um, and yeah, like I'm, I feel like I've got a good friend base. It all, I don't know. I guess when you've got family with you, yeah, then I don't. It doesn't really matter where you live. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if you're yeah, if you're on the road by yourself, <laughs> it's a bit different. Was it was it gnarly, or did you find it hard to be on tour for that nine months of the year, or is that where like having Dingo and Joel and that was like really helped that whole deal? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, there's when you've got your best mates, you're traveling with your best mates, and just having a hell of time. Like, it was it was great. Um, it got lonely at times for sure. Yeah, um, especially if you weren't synced up with the same flights or something like that and you're yeah. just going by yourself you're like shit where am I going but um, yeah that's um, it it made it definitely easier to have mates good mates on tour and um, mates that you can talk to about anything too yeah yeah was there a big difference because you would have been on tour well before like Instagram and social media like really took off was there a big difference in what the tour was like before Instagram socials, all that shit to then when it like really started to come in. Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it, it was even for us because all our events are live. Yeah. Before they were live was really different. Really? Yeah. Like, um, before they were live, like it was back in the days where surfing was just partying and, yeah. and stuff like that. So you go out and, you know, have a night out. And if you have a shit heat, no one will know about it until it's written up in the magazine. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and oh, so then like you could literally just live with that loss like you didn't lose almost because like no one knew, no one was talking about, no one really. Yeah, it was only like the few people that next were event. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Next event. Next yeah. event. But then when it became live on, on the webcast and you don't perform. Just yeah, a different level. It's a different level, yeah. yeah. Um, and now, yeah, Instagram and social media and stuff like that takes it to a whole nother level because um, everyone gets to have an opinion on your page. Yeah. You know, and um, and it's, I guess, dealing with that um, is can be difficult if, you, if you're not equipped. Um, like, yeah, like this, like, especially if you're like going for a world title and you got like this person's going for this person on this person yeah. and they they let you know yeah because for them at home it's, that's funny yeah, <laughs> yeah but they yeah. don't know what the, the actual person's like you know they don't know what they're going through in their in their home or you know what's going through their brain or whatever and um, you might just be in a shit mood and just be like that really hurt or yeah or whatever so it's um, yeah it can be a dangerous place um, but yeah you just Round events or whatever, you just try not to read comments. Yeah. So what was it, when you, when you were before it was live? What was the setup like? It was fully because nowadays you go and it's like everything is like literally to the minute. Was it just a fully loose sort of program back then? No, like it was it was well run still. Like yeah, not much as not much has Change changed on the event side. On the event side, yeah. like um, you know they they've kept a lot of the um. I guess the protocols, you know, have just, you know, you have a little warm up surf and then they'll start and, um, you know, and heats at the same time. Um, but like back in the day, like say if, you know, with seeding or whatever and you went back to back heats, they could easily switch them around and give the person an oh, extra like heat. A bit of, yeah, 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 yeah. Where yeah. now they can't. It's yeah. like, it's live. You, people blowing up why is he getting advantage or this or that um so yeah it does change but um it's it i think for the the structure of it all it's all pretty similar yeah okay but it was more the fact that 
I guess the implications of like winning or losing, like you just didn't feel it in the same way when it wasn't live and people weren't kind of watching you. Yeah, yeah. Like I remember, I remember one guy surfed so bad in one heat because he was out the night before, <laughs> and then the following year, friend of his did the same and just got lit up because it was live. Oh, just like literally <laughs> one year, one year difference. <laughs> it's like how come he didn't get in trouble and I did? Like, it was like. Just different times. Could you feel it change over the years while you were while you were on tour? Like, you, did it progressively get more and more serious? Um, that was probably my fault. Um, the serious side of it because I went from you know ripping my hamstring off, yeah, yeah. and then coming back and and I was probably the the one that sort of put so much time into fitness and the physical side yeah of it. and <laughs> you fucked it yeah, fuck that. And i'm bringing like <laughs> exercise balls down to the beach and stretching and I'm like, what's going on here and and i started having good results and everyone's like fuck we do we have to do this now and and so because there's always that. that one dude yeah like there's that so in motocross or supercross there's dude called ricky carmichael and before that mate the boys were fucking getting busted smoking weed at Havasu like yeah. dudes were just full party like 90s was just the party lifestyle yeah. and then this like short ginger dude came in and just started destroying everybody and it was like right eh, bedtime's 9 o'clock now for oh, like no. the rest of the sport yeah and it's yeah now it's sort of like we, we would even through that time like I'd train and do all that sort of stuff but I'd still go and have beers at the end event with everyone and where and would all still travel together in a sense, but then it started shifting a little bit, um, and now it's like everyone's got their own little entourage, everyone's got their own filmer, their yeah. own coach, like, yeah. and so it did change in that sense. Um, and sometimes, you know, every now and then it will go back to the old ways where everyone parties together, which is hilarious to see. But um, yeah, it's, it has changed a fair bit since the old days. There, it's just that way for every sport yeah like there's just always one guy at one time that comes on because it's a massive advantage to just not be fucking blind yeah. <laughs> like in yeah. high performance sport like it kind of makes sense or well, for some people <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> those people that serve better nugget um but no it's um yeah i think it just changes but yeah i guess for yeah for ours it it's progressively and we, we weren't a real professional sport mm. like we were like guys were athletes but weren't taking it that serious yeah and then and now it's really serious like, yeah yeah but how about like just the sport in general because i feel like even like i never i grew up in Kansas, so i didn't have anything to do with surfing and i moved to california in 2012 and then that's when i started like getting into surfing basically so that was like prime you know like you and even like jack freestone like mm -hmm. he was winning the junior worlds and shit like that um but you could see like the crazy hurley deals that were getting thrown around like even in the time that i kind of like just come into surfing it really seemed like it was a it really exploded from like an industry perspective it did yeah we sort of call that the golden era yeah okay. um you know they had crazy crazy marketing budgets um you know anyone you know they would sponsor all kinds of people for crazy amount of money and and then it was it was great because it was during my time but <laughs> now like it's it's pretty tough out there really and yeah it's um you know there's there's uh, the fair few guys on tour that don't have a major sponsor over a couple of hundred grand. Which like back then, if you were on tour, then it was like a million bucks guaranteed, right? Yeah. It was almost like you get your paycheck, you you make the tour and it was like, Oh, there's, there's your base salary of 150 grand or something. You know, top guys were getting yeah millions. And so, yeah, where now it's, there's not, I don't think there's that many million dollar contracts left. That's wild to mm. think. Like, that's a pretty short period of time. Yeah. What do you think? Why do you think the economics changed so much? Um, I think it had to do with um, the trying to the the brands almost 
saw the opportunity of going so big. They're like, oh, the stock market, let's jump on that. Yeah. And it went really well for a little bit and then it went... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and um, so yeah, that was that was a really tough one. I, you know, you see the likes of Billabong and Quicksilver, you know, they're owned by the same company now. That's wild. It's dude. so wild, um, and so you know, that marketing budget just got cut in Halved. half. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they got to sponsor both teams. Yeah, um, so you know, th- that's part of it. Um, yeah, it's it's it's, I think. I, I think it that's the biggest thing. Yeah. Is that surfing and but also too that the landscape of it all, so many more new brands came into the fold as well. Yeah. Um but it goes on trends as well. Yeah. You know, kids wanna wear big logo tees mm. today, tomorrow they don't. Yeah. And then now it's like in this phase of going back to the nineties yeah. of, you know, the same clothes i see those coming through i'm like not again <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, dude, I, i'm glad we had this done yeah that was shit back then <laughs> and they're still shit <laughs> uh, but do you do you think that you took it so seriously in like as in terms of being the guy that like changed it in a sense was that because you did look at like the nrl and you were a fan of other sports outside of it or were you just doing like your own thing yeah and that's what it took for you to get better i know the exact point it happened i um i was on on the couch after you know tearing my hamstring off the bone because that was a bow trip in indo right? yeah yeah Yeah. and um just had surgery and i'm sitting there i was in a pretty dark place um that's just fat and pasty and you know i couldn't do anything (laughs) yeah and um and I remember watching a heat and I, it was in France and I was against Denny Wills. And in my brain at the time, I was like, I got so smoked by him. And then I rewatched it and I it was wasn't watching, by much. Uh, and I was like, if I was just a little bit sharper here and there and, and I was like, I could have probably won that heat. And then I, um, and then I remembered two nights before I was on the piss. <laughs> <laughs> There it is. Yeah. And that was, I had this immense guilt come over me. I was like, you know what? I'm never doing that again. And I, um, so I, like, I wouldn't drink during an event, wouldn't drink in the lead up to an event. As soon as the event was done, I'd have a thousand. But yeah. you know, that, <laughs> yeah. but that was just my way because I didn't want to feel that guilt ever again. Yeah. So um, that was, yeah. That, that was just a personal thing yeah man it's crazy the that guilt and that feeling that you don't want to have like i've like literally just watched a friend he's a professional sportsman come into the start of the i'm doing this this and this, i'm changing i'm never doing this together right. gave me the pep talk and i was like fuck yeah like i'm stoked for you yeah and then did everything that he said he wasn't gonna do <laughs> and then he goes to an event gets smoked um, and like literally you could see it yeah in the in the guy and i'm just like i'm like gutted for him as a mate but then at the same time i'm like it's almost like i told you so bro like you you know well not even i told you so Mm. like you told yourself yeah you just didn't have whatever for whatever reason like you just couldn't like stick to that plan and that guilt is such a crazy real thing it is it is but some people run away from it Mm. um and but yeah for me it was just it stuck with me was it all because of you like the guilt that you put on yourself or did you have like a feeling of oh i'm letting down my family i'm letting down it like or it was just a full personal decision based on you pure personal that's cool though yeah and it was funny too because like you know back then you'd be like oh we've got the day off tomorrow let's go and have a beer Mm. like just have come have one beer and i was like no no and people were just like don't even ask him anymore yeah yeah um so yeah it was it was something that uh it was it was as good as it was for me it was hard also too because i sort of felt like i shut down part of my friends Mm. um like i guess that camaraderie side of it but i'd always come back at the end of the event (laughs) yeah 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 Yeah, that that is hard i mean i think people see that oh what time have you got to bail i gotta bail you gotta get out of here well all right we'll leave it we'll just cut it right there we'll we'll, uh (laughs) yeah no we'll uh we'll try and get one of these in another point uh 
a couple of years down the road or something. Sounds good. Check in, see we'll, how, you, see we'll how your swing's going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, the swing will still be shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, mate, thanks so much for coming in. No I, uh, I know you got to bounce. I really appreciate it. I All hope right. you enjoyed having a chat about Cheers. probably a lot of the same things that you've been asked before, but we uh, we really appreciate no, it's it. That's all good. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Mate. Appreciate it. Good hanging out. We are excited to announce the launch of our new membership site, gypsytales.com, packed with exclusive content and perks that you won't find anywhere else. This is your chance to become a part of the Gypsy Gang. And as a special bonus, if you sign up to an annual membership, you'll be entered into the draw to win our custom-built TC125. Gypsy Gang.